So let's keep going here with uh, the first 100 days of FDR's presidency. All right, so just as a recap from the first video, the first 100 days literally marks the first 100 days that FDR was in office. Um, he was very active, um, a major breakaway from Hoover's administration where he was blamed for not doing much at all. Um, ultimately, what we see is that uh, FDR calls an emergency session of Congress and he drafts a number of programs um, in order to help stimulate the economy, far too many programs to mention. So I just want to mention some of the really key ones that will probably show up on the AP exam. Uh, so the first uh, act that I want to mention in the 100 days is something called the Glass-Steagall Act. And uh, basically what this did was it was attempting to get uh, investment banking out of the commercial banking sector. Um, because if you think about it, there are two very different types of people who get involved in investing, right? Um, if you just own a small business, for example, you're probably investing in a very legitimate way. You're probably borrowing things uh, that are truly needed in order to stimulate your business, right? Whereas if you're speculating, right, so if you're an investment banker, most of the people that get involved in investment banking are those who have some extra money, right? So the assumption is that people who get involved in investment banking are probably on the wealthier side and they're speculating, right? So the idea is that in investment banking, you're sort of taking money from rich people, investing in relatively risky speculative activities and hoping to make a profit. But the problem is if these two types of banks are combined, then if there is a major failure in the banks, like we saw in 1929, uh, the legitimate, the more business oriented investments are also going to tank, even if speculation ultimately was the major cause for the bank failure. So the Glass-Steagall Act tried to basically create commercial banks and investment banks as completely separate institutions, right? So, um, and the other thing that it did, which was even more important, um, was it created something called the Federal, uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or the FDIC. This still exists. And what this did was it insured your bank deposits, right? So at first it was just $2,500. Remember that back in 1933, that was a decent amount of money, right? But then in 1934, they doubled it. So if you had $5,000 in the bank, up to that much money would be insured, right? So that meant that no matter what happened, your money would still be there. Um, and now the FDIC still exists and uh, $250,000 uh, is protected by the FDIC. So that was key in 2008 when the economy, uh, as you as you probably remember, also took a major dive with the failure of some major corporations like Lehman Brothers. Um, so basically, because we have the FDIC in place, left over from the Depression, it helped protect many people's uh, bank accounts in a way that would have been disastrous if we didn't have that type of protection enacted. In 2008, most people did not feel as monumentally affected. Clearly, it was still it was a very dramatic recession for us in 2008. But we didn't lose our life savings like so many people did in the Great Depression. This is thanks to Glass-Steagall. But unfortunately, a lot of the elements of Glass-Steagall actually were uh, repealed in 1999, and that's one of the reasons why uh, the some banks uh, actually became too big again. Ultimately, the phrase is "too big to fail," right? Um, so by repealing the Glass-Steagall Act, there has actually been um, there has been a lot of backlash, especially after the 2008 economic collapse uh, that Glass-Steagall should be reinstated. This is something that tends to be more favored by liberals, by the way. Okay, then you have the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, this was a, an organization that provided emergency aid for unemployed youth. So this was giving jobs just to young men. They were uh, pretty much all unmarried, I believe. Uh, at first, it was open to young men from the age of 18 to 23, and then they extended it later started at age 17 and went up to age 28. And basically the Civilian Conservation Corps gave unskilled labor jobs and they were all related to some sort of conservation effort or development of natural resources. So a lot of these jobs were in really rural areas. Um, basically what happened was if you were selected to be in the, uh, in the CCC, you would be sent off to work on some project. So you might be working on a national park somewhere or, um, or maybe some other sort of, uh, sort of environmental conservation effort. In exchange for your work, you were given food and shelter and clothing, and you were paid a very small wage. Okay, so it wasn't really the wage that was important about the CCC. It was much more the fact that basically this group of people that were unemployed and, and sort of felt useless and were restless, quite frankly, 
were now being put to work. And in addition to that, it uh, implemented a huge natural resource conservation program in every state and territory. And also just by the fact that people were working, it improved their morale, right? So, you know, basically it helped reforest the country, build parks, public service buildings, roadways in remote areas. It gave people jobs. It made people confident. And then with the money that they did make, most of them ended up uh, sending a portion of it back home to help out their families. Um, so that was a very effective program in just reinstilling confidence and getting young men back to work. And then you have the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, or FARA, and this does the same uh, for hard-pressed states. So in other words, uh, it started creating unskilled jobs in local and state governments, right? So um, what it did was, uh, in a way, it was a little bit more of an investment than just doling out money to people, right? You know, we, they could have pro just provided direct relief by just giving people money, right? But instead, what the Federal Emergency Relief Administration did was it actually gave people jobs, right? So this, again, even if it was slightly more expensive than just doling out money, it was psychologically more beneficial because the people who wanted to get a job, act as breadwinner, uh, literally get out of the house, and ultimately to give people enough money that they started to spend again and get that crucial currency back into circulation, that had a major benefit. So technically, these a lot of these programs actually cost the federal government quite a bit of money, but the long-term effect was that people did start spending again, right? So the Federal Emergency Relief Administration provided work for over 20 million people. And in the process, it developed public facilities on lands across the country. So again, another example of getting people to work. Uh, the first 100 days also paid attention to the plight of farmers. Uh, and that was best, uh, best indicated by the Agricultural Adjustment Act, or the AAA, um, which gave farmers relief. And uh, it was an interesting thing that they did. Ultimately, one of the major problems that was causing so many farmers to have so much financial trouble was they were still producing at World War I levels. And there wasn't enough of, dem of a demand for that level of products anymore. And so what the Agricultural Adjustment Act actually did was the federal government started to pay farmers to stop planting so much. And they even would pay them if they killed off their excess livestock. So basically, the Agricultural Adjustment Act was paying farmers to produce less. The purpose of this was to reduce the supply of products, thus raising the prices of them, right? And this does eventually work. By 1935 or so, the crop prices and farmers' income start to rise. When farmers make more money, it's less likely that they're going to have to foreclose their mortgage, which is obviously a good thing. But one of the negative effects of this, and it's quite ironic, really, is that while farmers were being paid by the government to destroy their crops and livestock, in other parts of the country, people were going hungry. So the government did not figure out some sort of plan to just redistribute this extra supply. Instead, they had to figure out a way to decrease production to raise the prices of those goods. So that's slightly ironic, but nonetheless, the AAA did help give farmers much needed relief. Um, then you have the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was a major contribution to um, the South, which was to a certain extent more industrial uh, after the Reconstruction era, but still lagged very far behind in the North in terms of its industrialization process. The Tennessee Valley, which, so this is the Tennessee River, and we see the location of all these different dams that were constructed by the Tennessee Valley Authority. The Tennessee Valley at this point was a very depressed area. Um, and there was, to a large extent, uh, sort of exhaustion, uh, exhaustion of the soil. This was high time tobacco farming uh, land, which was, you know, the soil oftentimes was way, uh, was ultimately overused and was not very productive. And so what the Tennessee Valley Authority did was it uh, employed workers to build a series of dams along the Missis or Tennessee uh, Valley, rather. So this did two things. One of them is that, of course, all the people that did the construction of these dams were given temporary jobs. And the other thing was that these dams provided electricity because they provided a source of hydroelectric power. 
And so uh, this is major because on the one hand, it helps catch the South up because they finally have better access to electricity and it was much cheaper when it came from this source. And it also, of course, gave people jobs. Now, uh, another side effect of this was that when electricity costs went down, some other businesses started to move into the South because it was cheaper to operate there. So, for example, the cheaper electricity did bring more textile mills to the South to make clothing, and more women were able to get jobs in the textile industry because of that. So, in a very direct way, the Tennessee Valley Authority gave jobs to people who literally constructed the dams, but in a long-term way, it gave even more people jobs because the further industrialization of the South brought more job sources down there. Now, there were some things that were slightly controversial about this. Um, you know, you had uh, about 94% of electricity generation before this project was all owned by the private sector. It was totally unregulated. This is an example of the federal government stepping in and very largely regulating the energy production of this area, but arguably it did it in a way that made electricity more accessible. Nonetheless, there were certainly people who didn't like the idea of the federal government playing such a large hand in economic development. Next, you have the National Industrial Recovery Act, or the NIRA, which is later shortened well, uh, in, in indist uh, a bureaucracy that is created from it is called the National Recovery Administration, or the NRA, not to be confused, of course, with the National Rifle Association. But anyway, that's what that stands for. So what the National Industrial Recovery Act did was it brought together industrial producers to regulate prices, output, and trade practices. So this was actually more controversial than the other 100 Days programs we've talked about so far. Basically, it gave the president, as well as the federal government, to start regulating industries more closely. Um, it encouraged uh, unions uh, to engage in collective bargaining. It set up maximum work hours and minimum wages. It created codes of fair competition between businesses. And all of these, again, were enforced by this new agency that was created called the National Recovery Administration. And um, many businesses push back to this because they're arguing that the government is intervening in their business operations too much. This is a very prominent example of economic regulation, which had essentially fallen by the wayside during the 1920s. But nonetheless, this is certainly something that helps the general consumer because prices are, um, are more controlled. Um, it prevents monopolies from emerging and also by uh, encouraging collective bargaining, it, it makes working conditions better, right? So the workers enjoy the National Industrial Recovery Act, business owners not so much. Then you have the Public Works Administration, or the PWA, which gave $3.3 billion, uh, to, uh, or the federal government provided $3.3 billion to engage in construction projects. And the point of that was to basically stimulate the economy. I, I use the words prime the pump. This is sort of an older saying. Um, there used to be water pumps that had to be primed before they could be used. So the idea was that you had to actually run water through them before you could use them. So priming the pump is just basically a way to say, all right, in order to get something working, you have to put some stuff through it beforehand, right? So in this instance, priming the pump is... The federal government has to spend a lot of its own money before people start spending their own money, right? So it's an example of deficit spending. It's one economic school of thought that tends to be much more uh, supported by Democrats. Uh, Republicans tend to be opposed to this. They tend to argue that things like trickle-down economics are much more effective, where you give money to a to a... a uh, to a relatively wealthy group and assume that their spending is going to stimulate spending from groups below them. But in any case, uh, what the Public Works Administration did was it also built large construction projects like dams, schools, hospitals, and bridges, and it employed many people, and to a certain extent it did uh, help people start to spend more money because they were taking in more revenue with these jobs that were provided. But nonetheless, it was a major expenditure, of course. All right, so I'm trying to keep these videos nice and short. So that's the 100 days. Um, I want to talk now in, these, uh, in the last video just about how 
uh, people react to the New Deal programs. Um, there are certainly people who critique it, which is important to acknowledge. Uh, there are certain people that say that the New Deal did not go far enough. And then um, we're also going to see some of the people that arguably were left out of some of the major New Deal programs. All right, so that will be next.